Welcome to OGL Dev. My name is Itai Meiri. In the previous episode, we started talking about perspective projection and uh, we focused mainly on the X and Y coordinates, which is really what you see on the screen. Now, there are two, uh, two topics that we need to talk about in order to provide uh, a basic coverage, at least, of this whole uh, perspective projection uh, issue. One is the aspect ratio, because right now, we have a square window. If, if you try to use a, a rectangle window, which kind of like uh, wider than the height, then you saw that the image becomes uh, stretched. Now, uh, I'm pretty sure that you don't want to play a first person shooter like that. So uh, we need to provide uh, some solution there. And uh, the other topic is the transformation of Z because uh, we need some way to limit the depth of the scene or, or the range of Z that is going to be actually rendered. So uh, let's start with the aspect ratio and then move on to the transformation of Z. Let's build a solution using an example. Here we see a standard HD window with a width of uh, 1920 and the height is uh, 1080. We calculate the aspect ratio by dividing the width by the height. So uh, in this case, we get about uh, one point 777 or something like that. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be great if we could simply configure the rasterizer so that the ratio between its width and height would match our window, basically match the aspect ratio as we can see in the following diagram. This way, we're naturally getting more pixels horizontally, which is what we want. I don't know if the GPU engineers ever considered such an approach. As you know, the rasterizer that we ended up with doesn't work like that. I guess it makes sense because it's more efficient to design fixed function hardware that has less room for uh, configurability. Hardware that always works in the same way. The fact that we can provide a very simple solution in software makes this approach uh, even more compelling. So the design approach that was eventually taken is to always use a square rasterizer that goes from uh, minus one to one on both X and Y. This rasterizer kind of uh, sits in the middle of the whole transformation procedure. You do all your uh, transformations to get to the rasterizer square coordinates. And from there we have something which is called a viewport uh, transformation that takes the square coordinates and converts them to window coordinates that match the window that the user created. At this point, I'm not going to go deeper on this uh, viewport transform. We may uh, review this uh, again sometime in the future. So what we want to do is to take all the points that after projection ended up in the wide rectangle with X components that go from uh, negative 1.777 to positive 1.777 and uh, map them linearly to points within the square from uh, minus one to one. For example, this green point on the left-hand side of the rectangle must be mapped to the left-hand side of the square. Intuitively, this means um, condensing all the points along the x-axis and the viewport transform would later remap them to a wider uh, rectangle so they will return to their native location with respect to one another. This is actually very simple to do. We just need to divide the projected X value by the aspect ratio. So in this case, if we divide minus 1.777 by uh, 1.777, we get minus one. And on the right-hand side, 1.777 will be mapped to one. The zero will remain at the same location and the rest of the points will become closer to one another, but they will retain their uh, relative distance from uh, one another. Therefore, the final projected x-coordinate, denoted here as uh, xp, is the projected x that we've already calculated, divided by the aspect ratio. Now, uh, let's see this in practice, okay? Okay, let's continue with the same code that we had at the end of the last episode, uh, part one of the uh, perspective projection tutorial. And uh, if we run this, we're getting the square uh, window uh, and the cube uh, looks okay. I mean, it's a, it, it's a real cube symmetrical across all the, uh, the sides. And the reason is that uh, I defined the height and the width of the window as 1000. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's change the width to 2000. 
and uh, run this. And uh, okay, so as you can see, it is stretched. And, and the reason that it is stretched is that we're still getting, I mean, the rasterizer still works from uh, minus one to one uh, on both the X and the Y, only that the viewport uh, transform translates um, or maps uh, minus one to one um, on the X axis to 2000, uh, to 2000 pixels. And on the, uh, on the vertical side, on the, on the Y, it's still 1000. Okay, so this makes the, uh, the cube stretch like that. So what we need to do is to uh, define the uh, aspect ratio by uh, dividing the width of the window by its height. And uh, don't forget to cast both uh, values to, uh, to float. Otherwise, you're, uh, you're doing an integer division and then uh, you're probably going to get a zero at uh, some point. And now let's add the division by uh, the aspect ratio to the uh, X uh, transformation, the location of the X right here at the, fir uh, the first row. And now when we run this, it looks okay. So the reason is that uh, the aspect ratio right now is two, right? We're dividing 2000 by 1000. So the aspect ratio is two. And then when we uh, divide the projected uh, X coordinate, we're actually getting uh, values of x from uh, minus 2, I mean, originally that were minus 2 to uh, to plus 2, to positive 2, they are now uh, getting mapped to minus 1 to 1, and then they are mapped to a wider uh, horizontal uh, window. And then it looks like that, and we are getting more, um, more pixels on the side, more space, because right now we, we don't have anything there, so it's, it's just black, but if, if there were uh, other objects here, uh, then we obviously uh, would have seen them. And now let's uh, make this uh, the other way around. Okay, so let's um, define the width as, uh, let's make it uh, 600 and the height uh, twice, uh, twice that, so uh, 1200. And now when we run this, um, it looks okay. And the reason is that the aspect ratio is no longer a two, now it is a half, okay? 600 divided by 1200, it's a half. So when we divide by that half, we're actually um, multiplying the projected X coordinates by two. So what you're actually seeing on the screen are the uh, projected X coordinates, the original projected X coordinates that were between uh, minus a half and the half, uh, these are now uh, transformed or mapped to uh, minus one to one and uh, mapped to uh, 600 pixels on the, um, on the X coordinate. So if uh, it's, it's lucky for us that we can even see the entire cube. I mean, if we take, uh, if, we, if we make this uh, even narrower, narrower uh, then uh, we may lose here. We're losing, we're starting to lose some of the cube because the aspect ratio grows uh, smaller. We're mu multiplying the projected X coordinates by a larger value. So we're getting uh, a smaller piece of the uh, original uh, 3D world. Okay, so we can see that it works uh, both ways. Let's talk about the Z value. We're going from uh, 3D coordinates down to 2D coordinates on the screen, so why do we even care about uh, the Z value? As I've already mentioned, there are potentially an infinite number of pixels with different Z values that are projected to any given 2D pixel, and we want to make sure that we render the one which is uh, closest to the camera. That's how stuff works in the real world, right? Uh, when there are overlapping objects, you expect to see uh, the closest one. One solution to this problem is called the painter's algorithm, where you sort the triangles from the furthest to the closest, and you render them in that order. So what you get in the end is that the closest triangles overlap the ones that are behind them. We can see an example in this uh, Wikipedia image. Uh, we start from the left, render the mountains at the back, then the, the planes uh, in the front of the mountains, and finally the trees. This method is uh, very limited because often the Z value changes across the, uh, the face of the triangles, and obviously the whole sorting 
becomes too complex, so uh, we don't uh, we don't do that. The solution that is actually used in OpenGL and uh, Direct 3D is to store the Z value of each pixel in what is called a depth buffer. The resolution of the depth buffer is identical to that of the color buffer. So for every pixel cell in the color buffer, there is a corresponding cell in the depth buffer. The depth buffer uh, is initialized with the largest uh, Z value uh, in all cells. And on every incoming pixel, we perform a depth test. We compare the incoming pixel's uh, Z value with the one in the depth buffer. If the incoming Z value is uh, smaller than the one in the buffer, we render uh, the color of the incoming pixel and we override the value in the depth buffer with the incoming pixel's Z value. This means that the incoming pixel is closer to the camera than the one that is uh, currently on the screen. If it is the other way around, the pixel is more distant, then we simply discard it and we, uh, and we don't do anything. The system actually supports uh, multiple uh, comparing conditions such as uh, less than, uh, less than or equal, uh, etc, etc. So in this example, we have a red triangle on the screen with the Z0 value for all pixels. We get an incoming green triangle with a Z1 value, which is smaller than Z0. So we render the green triangle, overriding the red triangle in the color buffer, and we update the depth buffer as you see here. So basically, we could have simply stored the original Z value of each pixel in the depth buffer and the depth test the algorithm would have worked um, as I've just described, but the results would not have been that great. And the reason is the way that values of floating point numbers are distributed across the 32 bits that we have in order to store it. You see, in the case of an unsigned integer, the values are evenly distributed from 0 to almost uh, 4.3 billion or uh, 2 to the power of 32 minus 1. That's the number of permutations that we can fit in 32 bits. And that's exactly the number of permutations that we have to represent floating point values from uh, negative infinity to positive infinity. Obviously, this is very limited in terms of the precision that can be achieved. So uh, back in uh, 1985, the designers of the IEEE 754 specification decided to distribute the floating point values in a way that most of them are within the minus one to one range, providing the greatest precision in that range. As we go outside of this range, the precision starts dropping. In fact, half of the available bit permutations, about uh, two billion, are used by just the minus one to one range. And we have another two billion for everything else. This means that in general, when dealing with floating points, you should strive to keep your core calculations within the normalized range and scale up for the final result. The designers of OpenGL were fully aware of this. So they've decided that the depth buffer will store Z values from minus one to one, where we have the greatest uh, precision and everything outside that range will be clipped. Uh, this means that assuming we don't plan on working in the normalized range, which is uh, obviously very inconvenient, we will need to map our original uh, Z values to minus one to one. Specifically, the near clip plane will be mapped to minus one and the far clip plane will be mapped to one. The GPU will take care of discarding or clipping triangles that are partially or fully outside that range. Now let's see how we can do that. First, let's review our current perspective projection matrix. This is the matrix that we came up at the end of the last episode, plus the division by the aspect ratio in the X, in the X component. Right now, for the Z value, we're doing a dot product of uh, 0, 0, 1, 0 with the position vector to copy the original uh, Z to the result. In general, if the third row of the matrix is uh, C, D, A, B, when we do a dot product with the position vector X, Y, Z, 1, uh, we get uh, C, X uh, plus D, Y plus uh, A, Z plus B. Obviously, X and Y cannot contribute to the transformation of Z, so we set C and D to zero, and we end up with the Z, T, which denotes the transformed Z uh, equals to A, Z plus uh, B. 
we must apply the perspective division. So we get uh, Zt equals to a plus uh, b divided by z. Our target is to find the values of a and b that will satisfy the requirements of mapping z values between near and far to minus 1 to 1. You can skip ahead if you're not interested in all the little details. I simply uh, like to make sure that uh, I understand every step, so uh, I'm, I'm showing it here. We can replace z with near and far and get the minus 1 and 1 respectively. This allows us to extract a and express zt using b only. Now let's move minus 1 to the right hand side of the equation and find the common denominator on the left hand side. Next we can extract b in the denominator and multiply both sides by far z times near z. We can now express b using only far and near z. Let's plug it back into the a equation. Near z in denominator and the denominator cancel each other out, obviously. And after a bit of cleanup, we find the equation for a using near and far z only, similar to what we have already in b. So uh, here we have the final equations for a and b. And we can plug them back into the perspective projection matrix to get the final version of this matrix. Now, I did an interesting experiment to test the transformation of z. I set the value of near z to be 1 and the value of far z to be 100. And I calculated the a and b factors using the equations that we've just uh, developed. I created a column, as you can see here, with all the values of z in that range using uh, steps of uh, 1 tenth. I used the equations uh, a plus b divided by z to calculate the transformed z. We can see that uh, 1 is indeed mapped to minus 1, and uh, 100 is mapped to 1. Now let's create a plot of, the, of these two columns. Let's uh, set the minimum y value to minus 1, so it will be a bit uh, nicer. What we get is a nonlinear mapping between the original z and the transformed z, due to the division by z. We can see that the best precision is achieved when the original z is below 20, and as z grows higher, the precision drops, and many values are mapped to very close values in the transformed z range. To avoid numerical issues here, you should uh, plan your scene in a way that the z range will be kept as tight as possible. For the z transformation, I define the near z to be uh, 1 and far z to be 10. And the z range is near z minus uh, far z. This is simply because we need this uh, here in the denominator according to the, uh, the equations that we've just uh, developed. So here's, here, here's the cal calculation of uh, a and b. And we just plug them uh, right here in the uh, projection uh, matrix. So if we run this, uh, everything looks okay uh, because this range is uh, large enough to fit the entire cube. But the cube itself, uh, let me remind you, the size uh, goes from um, a half up, uh, from, from actually from a minus a half up to uh, a half uh, in all uh, axes. So when we translate it, uh, to a distance of 2 on the uh, z-axis, it fits in that range. Uh, if, we, if we take the near z a bit uh, forward, so for example, let's make it uh, one and a half, and we run this, okay, so you can see that we're, now we're losing uh, the, closer, uh, the closest part of, uh, of the cube, because some of, uh, some of the projected uh, z-coordinates are uh, below one and a half, so they are now uh, clipped. And um, we can do this also on the far z. Let's make this back one, and let's let's change the far z to two. And uh, it, do, it doesn't seem to have any effect, I guess, because the effect is uh, at the other end of the uh, of the cube, which we cannot see. We need to look at it from the top, but we still don't have the camera. We'll soon have it. So for now, let's bring this down a bit. Let's try one, 1 1.9. And yeah, I think you can already see that we're losing 
uh, some parts here. Let's uh, change this uh, to 75, 1.75. And uh, as you can see, we're, we're starting to lose the end of the of the cube. Okay, so the transformation of Z uh, works as expected. Okay, so I think that right now we have a solid understanding of how perspective projection works. The next uh, logical step would be to uh, handle the camera. This will allow us to change the orientation of the viewer and uh, basically move freely uh, within the 3D uh, world. So that's the topic for our next episode. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did, please smash that like button for me and uh, subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching and uh, I will see you soon.